All right. Welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is Rachel Marshall and co-host Bruce Weiner. We are both your co-hosts. And today we have a special guest with us. And this is Dave Laundromat Millionaire Men's. So I, I love the um, addition into your middle name. So Dave, welcome to the show today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Awesome. We are as well. And it's always really exciting to get to have the opportunity to talk with people who have a very interesting story. And in addition to their story, something that they want to share with the world. And I think that we're going to find both of those today. So if you are curious about laundromat business, or you just want to hear some success stories of somebody who has really been able to pave a way and do something different in an industry than what is typically done, building wealth through something unique, we have a great show for you either way. So Dave, I wanna share just a little bit of background before we jump into your story. So Dave Menz is a laundromat industry veteran and the owner of the Queen City Laundry Chain of Laundromats in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now Dave's inspirational journey from purchasing a struggling laundromat to becoming a millionaire has inspired many entrepreneurs to try and overcome their own obstacles while building wealth. So here is um, the opportunity to share some of those secrets of your success. So Dave, actually Bruce, thank you for joining us on this exciting show this morning. Any thoughts that you have before we jump into his backstory? Um, Let's see if we have Bruce. Here we go. Bruce, you're back. Yeah, they're digging outside. So I'm, I'm I, uh, okay. I don't know if they <laughs> mess with my internet connection or what, but we're good now. Awesome. Bruce, any thoughts that you have that you would like to share before we jump into Dave's backstory? Well, I think the most important thing anytime when you're, when you're considering starting a business um, is to actually understand that there's the textbook version and what everybody tells you, you know, how you run something and the MBA program. So you do this, this, this. And then there's the real life version. You know, the, 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 the actual uh, version that you get your MBA from actually running businesses. And, and I believe from, you know, looking at David's uh, background, he has a real life MBA. And understands and going to give us tidbits that all of our business owners are going to just really benefit from today's show. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. So Dave, let's pass the mic to you here. Share with us just a little bit about how did you get into the laundromat business in the beginning? Well, doesn't everyone dream of owning a laundromat someday? (laughs) (laughs) No, seriously. I haven't met anyone yet that does. In fact, I'm one of the ones that's crazy enough to actually enjoy it, um, even as I do it. (laughs) No, the quick version is I, I grew up really poor as a young kid in Flint, Michigan. And I was never very good at school and I didn't see a traditional corporate path for me. Um, it just wasn't in my DNA. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know anybody that was an entrepreneur or a business owner, but I was always just from afar kind of admiring people that were without knowing them. Mm. And I'm the type of person that I don't like. And I didn't, I don't know that I realized this at a young age, but looking back now, I realize like, I don't like limitations. I don't, I don't like limitations. I don't like uh, people, people or, or organizations or things telling me that I can't accomplish X. Um, I like to believe that if I spend enough time and, you know, gain the knowledge and have the right mentors and the right opportunities and, you know, good old fashioned grit plays a part in that for sure. um, That I can accomplish almost anything that I want to, or at least I'm going to die trying. And uh, an entrepreneur, you know, when you have that mentality and not everybody, you know, that's not for everybody, but when you have that mentality and that drive, entrepreneurship just kind of calls out to you. And it did to me from a very young age. Um, and it wasn't, you know, everybody always says, did you dream of owning a laundromat? The answer is no. I didn't really ever care what the business was. I was always fascinated by business. Um, I mm-hmm. feel like too many times people focus on the product and they, they forget that the product is a a rather insignificant a part of being a business owner or an entrepreneur. Um, I always say it's roughly 10 to 15%. Uh, Business lessons, character traits, the things that make you successful or not in business and entrepreneurship, I really believe 80 to 85% of them are transferable from industry to industry. Mm, That's so wise. It's very interesting that uh, 
you said so much there. One was having a growth mindset. One was that entrepreneurial spirit that whatever industry somebody's in, there's always this thing that desires freedom. And you said you didn't like the limits or the, the limitations from somebody saying, Hey, you can't do this. And I think as entrepreneurs, we're uniquely wired to push past those obstacles and boundaries. And we kind of get almost a, a thrill or a charge out of that kind of challenge, realizing that we have so much capability to shape our future. And so you're definitely speaking to the exact audience that we have <laughs> listening to our show, because that is, that is the true spirit of entrepreneurship that you've, you've shared right there. So, so when did you decide to start looking to buy a laundromat? Had you already been in business? Were you already investing? Or was this kind of your first go at something to, to kind of break into that entrepreneurial space? Yeah, well, people aren't going to expect this. <laughs> so, so everything I just told you, I completely pushed aside because I grew up very poor. Um, and when you grow up in poverty, um, you know, what success looks like to you is relative. So the middle class and the white picket fence and the paycheck to paycheck that so many people fight to get away from, that looks like success to, to people that grow up in, in extreme poverty like I did. Mm -hmm. And so that was actually what I chased. So at 19 years old, um, I tried community college for a year. It wasn't for me. Um, for the reasons I just mentioned, I left that world. I got an entry level job at the local telephone company here in Cincinnati. Um, and the reason I took the job was because they promoted from within and they offered mm -hmm. internal training and, and mentorship and things like that. And I thought, well, man, that seems like a good path because I didn't have any money. How was I going to start a business anyways? Um, and so that was the path I took. And I ended up being in corporate America for 17 years. Um, I was, I was promoted five times. Um, I kind of reached once again, what was kind of perceived as my ceiling within the industry. I had, you know, I was married. I had three young kids at home. I had the typical middle-class lifestyle, so to speak. And, uh, and I, you know, the, co the company that I started working for at 19 was very different when I got to it at the end of it. And so it wasn't as fulfilling and satisfying uh, to work there as it was when I was young. But I also look back and think, well, it's probably not fair to blame the company either because I had grown, I had matured, and I had hit one of those ceilings that I wasn't okay with at 30 years old or whatever, 32 years old. I wasn't okay with being like, I'm just getting by for the next however many years. I needed more challenges. And one day I just woke up, I was getting ready for work early in the morning. It was 5 a.m. I was a, at, the, at the end of my career, I was a lineman for the telephone company. So I was the guy that, you know, climbs telephone poles and fixes phone lines and things like that. Hmm. And that was kind of the pinnacle of my career. It was a pretty good job. And I woke up that morning, I was putting my blue jeans and my work boots on in the bathroom. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, you sell out. Hmm. And, and that changed everything for me. That was my... That was one of many aha moments where I was like, you know what? I think I was roughly 30 years old because this wasn't at the end of my career. I worked there for another four years after that. Um, and uh, I just looked in the mirror and I was like, you know, you've always dreamed of being a business owner. You've always dreamed of being an entrepreneur. Um, I had tried a few quote unquote side hustles along the way uh, and failed miserably and lost money and filed bankruptcy. And I mean, it wasn't always a smooth path by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm, I'm the type of person I'm just going to keep coming. Like I always mm -hmm. say, if I'm, if I'm not in the ground, I'm just going to keep coming at you. Cause that's, you know, pe people like to talk about their superpowers nowadays, right? They're like, Oh, Bruce, what's your superpower? Well, my only superpower that I can find is I just won't quit. I call it stubborn obstinance. Like I just <laughs> won't quit coming. Um, and that's not always a good thing by the way, but I have learned to channel it for good. So what ended up happening is I, I'm, I had that aha moment in the mirror. I talked to my wife who knew me very well. And she was like, yes, you've always wanted to own your own business. And we started saving. And for the next three or four years, we lived below our means, saved everything we could. And I eventually found a local laundromat for sale on Craigslist. Um, I had been looking for years at businesses for sale. And as I mentioned earlier, I didn't care what the product was. I didn't care what the industry was. Um, I just needed a business that was, and I didn't, term, you know, I didn't have the terminology down that I do today, but I needed a business that was flexible because I knew whatever business I bought, we didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a high business acumen. I knew I was probably going to need to start as a side hustle and hopefully grow it into something where I could eventually leave my job. Um, and there's a few industries that kind of attract you to that. And the laundromat industry was one of those, but I, I estimate that I researched 
several hundred businesses before mm-hmm. finding the laundromat industry. So um, it's funny because as passionate and as big of an advocate of our industry as I am now, you would think I would have figured out how great this business was and like went right at it. Like I'm going to own a laundromat someday. And it was the complete and total opposite of that. <laughs> That's exciting that you share that though, because I think as much as every story looks really linear from the end, the end point, the vantage point when, when you can look back, I think Steve Jobs said this, the stars align looking backwards. It, it looks like everything really just all fell into place for you. But when you're in the middle of it, it can really feel unpredictable. It can feel like, well, I'm just doing the next right thing. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm going to make this one great decision. And really that is what paves that path. And I love that you shared that it wasn't necessarily predictable. You didn't know where where it was going to land, but you had that resilience. I I love that you shared that um, stick-to-itiveness. You said, just won't quit. I like to see, think of that as perseverance and tenacity. Um, so those are some words that I, I get to share with my, one of my daughters, who is very tenacious about everything as well. So, <laughs> so let's kind of jump forward now. So you're on Craigslist of all places, looking for a business to purchase. What made you say, yes, this is the one. Well, with every business I had researched before this laundromat that I eventually bought, um, I just went down the path of due diligence. And I had done a lot of reading. I estimate I've read thousands of books on entrepreneurship in my life at this Mm -hmm. point. And I had read probably six or 700 at that point. And so I knew a little something. I had a little bit of a clue. Um, And I just started down the path of due diligence with every business that I found on Craigslist or anywhere else. And every time, um, every time I came to a point where there was either a red flag or multiple red flags that just said, this isn't for you, for my situation, for my personality, whatever. And I'm not the type of person that has the whole paralysis analysis thing, but I'm also not reckless. Like I'm probably somewhere in the middle kind of balanced wise. And I, I just looked at every situation. It's like, okay, this isn't the one, but when I find the one I'll know it just happened to be the one. So what I tell people is I found this local laundromat for sale. I dove into it as intense as I had every other business. Uh, my wife jokes to this day that she just thought I was going to look at businesses forever, but never actually buy one. And I think she kind of hoped that would happen because uh, <laughs> she's not a risk taker by nature. And, uh, and, and this one, you know, I, I tell people, I'm like, I just started down the path of due diligence. I never had a red flag. And I just one morning found myself at the closing because there was hey, nothing could, to stop me. There wasn't anything to stop me from closing. That's, that, that's wonderful. Could, if you don't mind, could you share some of the numbers, like what the purchase price was, how much you had to put down, you know, how, it, if you did financing, how that process is for our, for our listeners? Yeah, that's quite a story actually. So I'll make it, try to make it short. Um, yeah, the, we bought the business for $85,000 and the business was losing money. So that automatically like horrifies people. They're like, why would you pay $85,000 for a business that's losing money? And the answer is I was purchasing what I call value add or opportunity cost, right? Mm -hmm. I knew what I could turn it into. And this place was a stereotypical laundromat. You know, if you say the word laundromat in society, there's a negative connotation associated with that. Um, And unfortunately, our industry has, has earned that reputation. And instead of seeing this rundown kind of cesspool of a just awful situation, Um, I just looked at it and saw opportunity and I didn't know a lot about the industry, but I looked around at all the competitors and within a 20 mile radius, there was about nine laundromats in the area and all of them were in as bad, if not worse shape than this one. Mm. And I thought, well, I don't know a lot about business, but I do understand the laws of supply and demand. And I know my community. I've lived here for a long time. It's a thriving, growing suburb in Cincinnati. Um, It doesn't appear that any of these laundromats are serving this community well, And so if I fix it up and make it a nice place, seems to me like it should grow and should become profitable despite it not being. So I really saw myself as just kind of buying a location and an opportunity, but I paid the 85 for it. We had saved up over about four years, about $35,000. We put about 20,000 down on the business and uh, we were rejected over 25 times by banks um, before we finally got an SBA loan through my local credit union here in Cincinnati. And we're able how many to times did you say you were, how many times were you rejected? Yeah. 25. That is it was, uh, resilience right there. It was, oh. it was, I, I can't, I like, I just made such light of it. It was just gut wrenching. 
like after two or three, it'll just, if you really just bleed business ownership and you know, you're ready and you know, you want to do this and you know, you're going to go after this. Like most of humankind has never seen anybody go after something like it just rips your heart out. And the Mm -hmm. saddest part was I kept hearing, you know, I had good credit. Um, I had, we had a, a, a decent nest egg. We lived well below our means, our, our personal finances. I was keeping my job, so there was no risk there. Um, we could actually afford personally, we could afford to cash flow the note for the entire length of the loan that we were asking for. And they would still tell us no. And the reason why was always the same. You've never run a business. You don't have a college degree. Mm. And this business is losing money. Who do you think you are? I mean, it was, it was, it was gut-wrenching. It's the only way I know how to describe it. <laughs> So, but it didn't change your mind. No, not at all. So, so let's take it from here then. So what did your, uh, what's what's the timeline? Like how long ago did did that happen? How long ago? Was that the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. When was that first purchase? Uh, This would have been, well, we closed on it in April of 2010. So it's been about 12 years now. Okay. So you finally got an SBA loan. And you said you put 20,000 down. So you had the loan for 65,000. Yep. So then what was your timeline for what kind of capital, what kind of improvements did you do? How did you do the value add? And then what was your financials like in terms of the cash flow afterwards? Yeah, we were, we were negative about a thousand dollars a month cash flow from the very beginning, um, not counting our note, which if I remember right, was around 1500 a month. So when we closed, we were negative $2,500 a month, uh, which when you're just a little middle-class family with a three-week-old baby at home and a toddler at home and a wife who's a school teacher and a 12-year-old at home, mm. it, it was it was terrifying is what it was, yeah. but I just believed in myself that much. And um, <clears throat> what, what ended up happening is we took that 15000 we had left over and we used that for all the materials and supplies. And I worked, I estimate I worked 90 to hundred hours a week between my full-time job and working in my businesses for the next four years. Now we eventually bought a couple more stores and I can get into that. But with the first store, I did that for the next <clears throat> probably three and a half to four months. And we put all that $15,000 in it every month. I told you we were kind of living below our means. Um, and so every month we had a few thousand dollars of cash flow. Uh, from our jobs that we would put into the business. And I would just, every day I would go to my job, I would work, I would go to the store afterwards and I would work till I couldn't stand up anymore. I just didn't, I didn't see another way. There wasn't another opportunity. And so we did that for four or five months and it was a lot of cosmetic. It was a lot of painting and putting up TVs and um, we fixed all the equipment because 80% of the equipment was out of order when we bought it. Oh. And so we had to have a local equipment distributor that I made a great relationship with early on. And they kind of became a mentor and they helped us figure out what equipment to fix and, you know, what was worth saving and salvaging and things like that. And the short answer is within about four months, I knew I was onto something because we were making about $1,500 a month after our debt service. Um, okay. And that's, that's a, what, 12, 14 week period of time. So it turned quickly and that I didn't know a lot, but that reassured me that my comment about laws of supply and demand, that I was onto something. And I knew if I just kept going, that there was a, I didn't know I'd be where I am today. Never dreamed in a million years, but I did know that I was onto something and that I could do much, much more if I could do that in such a short period of time. Oh, absolutely. So let's step the story forward then. When did you make another purchase and what did that look like? Yeah, so we got that store profitable. Um, A few months later, we borrowed (laughs) $150,000, which sounds insane, and bought uh, what I call kind of round one of some new commercial laundry equipment. So brand new shiny equipment to put in the store and kind of make focal points and features of the store. And the business within uh, probably 11 months or so was was making us probably three or $4,000 a month. And for a guy with, you know, middle-class lifestyle, I was like, wow, I mean, I can go to work every day and this business kind of makes me three or $4,000 a month. And so I thought, you know, if I do this a few more times, I could quit my job and be a full-time business owner and entrepreneur. And so that's what I did. I found another location that was actually one of those other nine I described. 
it was within a 20 mile radius of my store. It was actually on my way to work because uh, I had about an hour commute to work each, each way. <clears throat> Excuse me, I found one that was right off the highway and uh, it was actually in worse shape. It wasn't losing money, but it was closed. It was completely out of business and it was in a oh, shopping wow. center. And I approached the property owner of the shopping center and I said, you know, I think this is a good location. I think I can fix it up. I'm in the industry. This is what I do. I own this store over here. I've turned it around. And if you'd be willing to sign me to a lease, I'd be willing to, you know, reinvest my own capital in this business. And so we negotiated kind of a win-win situation. Um, they actually gave me nine months rent-free while I remodeled the place. I borrowed, I think, a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, for new equipment in the store. The equipment that was salvageable, we we tore out, reconditioned. I mean, this was all part of that 90 to 100 hours a week. Um, was we just basically, I worked myself to the bone um, and we borrowed probably more money than most people would advise. Um, mm -hmm. But I just, I really knew I was, I really felt like I was onto something here. And one of the things I've learned about business and entrepreneurship is the most successful people and the most fulfilled people, which aren't always the same thing. Mm. There's a direct correlation in those two things and their focus in business. And my upbringing, I was raised in a Christian home and my upbringing was very simple. We're on earth to serve others. That's mm -hmm. what I was taught, um, that we are here to serve others. And my mentor, who was my equipment distributor that I mentioned earlier, um, he was raised in a similar home. He had a similar belief system. So we clicked. Um, and he told me very early, he became a mentor almost immediately to me. He said, Dave, always focus on serving others and everything else will fall in line. Mm -hmm. Like Everything else will take care of itself. Just do that in spades. And that was kind of easy for me to latch on to because it was kind of already who I was. And so I just did that. And it, as long as you're in the right opportunity, meaning you're not in an overpenetrated market or something like that, <clears throat> everything else will take care of itself. And so some people might look at the situation or listen to the story and it, it may sound like kind of reckless, but you have to understand that I had the right foundation. Mm -hmm. And once I had the right foundation, there was nothing stopping me. Nothing in the world was going to stop me. Um, and it, it, that store, we quick, quick version of that is we borrowed all that money. Uh, we opened the store within, you know, typically it takes for retail businesses, depending on the industry, it typically takes anywhere from one to three years to kind of get from losing money, which you are the first week you're open to, you know, making money to being in the black. Um, we were, we were, uh, we were netting a couple thousand dollars a month within the first 30 days. Nice. So that's how pent up the demand was. That's how much pain people were in. That, mm -hmm. That's how much the community needed what I was willing to provide. Um, and I could have been just completely paralyzed by the fact that I was borrowing a few hundred thousand dollars to mm -hmm. buy equipment to put in this laundromat that was closed. And a lot of people would be paralyzed by the, well, why was it closed? What, 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 did, what, did, they, what did they do that I'm not doing or vice versa? Um, and so there was some homework and some diligence involved there too. But what it boils down to is within 12 to 14 months, probably closer to 14 months, um, we had two side businesses, if you will, that were very flexible. Um, a lot of people think the laundromat industry is passive. It's not passive, but it is mm -hmm. flexible. There's work to do and you got to do the work, but you pretty much get to decide when you do it for the most part. And so I would go to work. I would take care of my obligations at work. I would take care of my obligations with my family. And I literally gave up my life other than those two things for the next four or five years. Um, and within 14 to 16 months, we were, I mean, we were probably making, a, in addition to our debt service, we were probably making six or seven, maybe even 8,000 a month. Um, and, uh, and then a new lesson came in, which is I had always learned that one of the keys to success um, in life is delaying gratification, being disciplined enough to say, okay, I got $8,000 a month that I didn't have 18 months ago. Well, I could go buy a new house. I could go on a fancy vacation, I could buy myself a Corvette and show all the guys at work how successful I am. Um, but we just decided to be very disciplined and I call it keeping my hand out of the cookie jar. Um, mm -hmm. But we basically just delayed gratification for another four or five years. And we worked on paying down our debt. Our businesses were not perfect. There was a lot of you know, polishing a bad situation and making it a little bit less bad, but it was still, you know, some people call that like lipstick on a pig. I've heard that terminology. Um, and there was a lot of that, a lot of band-aids going on for sure. And so every month with that cash flow coming in, we would just look at the business and say, 
what needs the most attention. And if it needs four or five months of saving that up to make a $50,000 improvement, then let's do that. And we did that for those two stores for the next three years or so and got them to the point where they were just, I always said, once I left my full-time job, I felt like that was a pretty big risk for me financially. And I always said, I need these businesses in the best position, best condition possible when I leave my job. Cause then if they need a $50,000, whatever, how am I going to get that? Now I'm living off the money. Mm-hmm. And so that was really our focus. And that kind of takes you through the first three or four years of our journey. We just plugged hard. There's so many lessons there. I think, I mean, we could, we could highlight all of them. One, I just want to say it's the true entrepreneurial spirited person who can look at leverage and recognize that it's not just debt. It's not just bad. It is for the purpose of creating more money. And if you know what you're doing and you know what return you can create by using that capital well, that's arbitrage. That's what banks do because they have capital. They then are able to use that capital create to create interest, to create cash flow, and to create more in return than what they are having as the cost of their capital. So I just wanted to point that out here. And then the idea then also of using that discipline and not just jumping straight from I made the money to consuming the capital, because then if you're not continuing to build up an opportunity fund, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you cannot continue to grow. Now, certainly you want to take some profit, enjoy your life as well. As a result, you don't want to be in a position that you're just a slave to the business because that's nothing different than being self-employed, but you were able to have vision that allowed you to see past just where you were at the time to look at what you were creating. And I love how you shared that balance of not just spending it all today. Bruce, I know you had some thoughts there too. Yeah, Dave, and, and uh, this is the first time we've had you on the show, so I don't know you uh, well enough, and maybe you don't know the answer to this question, but you know, a lot of the opportunities with these laundromats, uh, I would imagine, is the, the additional um, capital that you spend on equipment can then be depreciated for tax mm-hmm. purposes. Uh, uh, as your bookkeeper <laughs> and your tax uh prepare, educated you enough that you could share some of those uh, lessons with our audience? Well, uh, the, the quick answer to that, Bruce, is I married an accountant by trade. I said oh, she's okay. a school teacher, <laughs> uh, but my wife's actually a former CPA. Um, oh, nice. And she, she hated that world, ironically. So I went and created a bunch of businesses and drug her back into it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I tell people all the time, she's the brains of the oper- operation. Uh, from the money standpoint. I mean, obviously we talk, I've learned a lot along the way. I'm certainly not an accountant, but yeah, I tell people all the time, I believe this is one of the best small businesses in America. And I really genuinely believe that. And one of the reasons is the tax advantages. Um, So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole and pretend like I'm an expert because I'm not, but I definitely know enough to understand that when you borrow money and you leverage money, as Rachel mentioned, and you can generate more cash flow from it, and the majority of that cash flow, you don't end up paying taxes on legally because you have all these write-offs because you borrowed all this money. And it's this, you know, I, I always tell people it's a bit success and really anything in life, but I'll, I'll apply it to business really based on two things, opportunity and knowledge. Like if you, mm-hmm. if you can, if you have the knowledge and you find the right opportunity, I mean, unless you're just lazy, uh, I mean, the sky is the limit for you. And so I understood enough of the tax advantages to understand that as long as we kept building and reinvesting, that we really were going to pay zero to little taxes. Many years we've paid no taxes. Um, and some years we've paid very little. Uh, but it's because we were literally at, at one point borrowing millions of dollars. Um, and yeah, we had to pay that money back and there was risk associated with that. Um, but but yeah, that's the, that's the quick answer to your question. It's, it's actually a part of leverage. If, if you understand how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for sharing that. And, um, and we certainly aren't CPA, CPAs either, mm-hmm. but I've sat, I've sat in on hundreds of these types of meetings. Mm-hmm. And the, the basis for our listeners real quickly is um, obviously the, there is a business expense with, with borrowing money. But then uh, if you buy capital um, equipment that can be depreciated, you can actually depreciate that on a schedule against your income. And um, you can rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, because you're all you're always needing more equipment, and you can put it on a depreciation schedule to do that. 
the other thing to the other thing to when people a lot of times say, well, that's not fair. These business owners are making money, but they're not paying taxes. But you mentioned it, but you're taking all the risk. And what people don't realize is if you make money in any given year, you have to pay you have to pay taxes on all the money that you legally have to put on your taxes. If you lose money, you're only allowed to take off three thousand dollars of that a year. So you you do not get to deduct that. If you go out of business, you don't get to deduct that all at one time, unless you then have a capital gain later on in your life. You can offset that capital loss with a capital gain. So the business owner, the entrepreneur, is really taking all the risk to provide the services, as you mentioned, to provide the additional jobs, because I'm sure you've hired a couple people along the way. And this is the reason why these tax incentives are put into the tax code. And we like to emphasize that, Dave, all the time, Mm -hmm. because uh, people have to understand that there are advantages uh, to owning businesses much more than just the cash flow, the tax Mm -hmm. advantages. And they're they're not loopholes. They're incentives that were put into the tax code. So I'll take it a a step further, Bruce, if it's okay. And I'll point out to people. Sure, absolutely. that the reason that the government incentivizes people like us to do this is because what happens? Like what happens as a result of borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars, assuming you have the right knowledge, the right opportunity, your business grows, right? Business is growing is what grows our economy. It's Mm -hmm. what creates jobs. And Mm -hmm. by default, those are good things for our economy, right? For our, for our, our industry. But what's, what's also a result of that is, is more income. And eventually somewhere along the line, I'm going to pay taxes. I promise you that. (laughs) Like, I mean, you eventually, everybody reaches a point where they pay their taxes. And the government's idea is I would rather you pay taxes on a multi-million dollar operation with 40 employees than I would you pay taxes on a thousand dollars a month in income in the first six months that you own a business. So that reinvestment and that leverage that we're talking about, the government understands not a hundred percent of the time, but the government understands the likelihood of what the result of that is going to be. It's good for our society. It's good for the jobs we're creating, but it's Mm -hmm. also good for the government's tax base because it's as the GDP grows, the tax base grows and they understand that too. So it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, to be honest with you, like we're getting a little, a little nerdy on the money and stuff, which I love to do, by the way. And in this, you know, some people don't enjoy that, but the fact of the matter is this is one microcosm of why I love business. Like I'm not an engineer mind by trade. I'm not like a dig down into the scientifics. I'm more of a people person, but the fact of the matter is when you drill down into the people side and you drill down into the money side, which are the two parts of business, by the way, there's math and there's people. That's what makes a business or breaks a business. When you drill down into those things, to me, it's just absolutely fascinating, like a little kid on Christmas morning to, to, to figure out and understand the things we just talked about. Like, I didn't always know those things. Like I knew enough to like go. I was like, I want to make some money. When I grow my business, I got to borrow money. I got to pay it back. And I was like, okay, well, I didn't make any money last year. So I don't know any taxes. That's kind of a no brainer. But then you look and you go, okay, but we did make some money, but we still don't owe taxes. Well, why don't I owe taxes? And then your accountant or your wife explains it to you and you go, no kidding. Like that's just a part of the cycle of business. That's a, that's a, I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's, it's, you know, I'm a big, every penny I've ever made in my life, I've made in servitude to others. Mm Mm-hmm every penny. And I sleep really well at night knowing that I know not everybody has, but Mm -hmm. I have, and I sleep really well knowing that at night and how beautiful of a thing that it is to know that I can elevate my family. I can literally change my family tree. You mentioned jobs. When we bought our first laundromat, there was no employees. It was completely unattended. We have a staff of 40 employees and a hundred thousand dollar payroll and or month monthly now. Um, And some are entry level, but a lot of them are not over half of them are not entry level positions. Um, so we built a multi-million dollar organization and those jobs make a difference. Trust me, talk to my employees and find out if they appreciate and value their jobs. Um, so all these things are a part of just make what makes me just passionately, obsessively love business ownership and entrepreneurship. And it's really just a matter of knowledge. Like it's just a matter of digging down, talking to the right people, reading the right books, watching the right podcasts, 
blog articles, magazines. I mean, I'll take information from anywhere I can get it. And then I put it all into one pot. And I, I always say, I pull out the golden nuggets. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those golden nuggets. Cause there's a lot of noise, right? There's a lot of like, right. there's oh, a lot sure. of hogwash out there in the world. Um, and you got to find those nuggets and then apply those. And then you just got to plug them into the right team. You know, I don't have to be an expert in accounting, but I need an expert in accounting. Yes. Right. So the business yes. is a team game. Oh, there's so many pieces here. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, Rachel, but um, I got a line of thought because of, you know, we, we Rachel I, and I actually have a, uh, one of our, our um, clients who actually owns several laundromats in Houston. So we talked mm-hmm. through him consulting and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so one of the things I know he's going to want me to ask you is, you know, the laundromat is a, is a cash, uh, highly, highly cash business. Mm-hmm. And so you have people handling cash. Now, I know you probably keep that to a minimum, but you're going to have some employees that are going to ha- handle cash. And, at, and I own other businesses that aren't that, ca- that much cash, but you're always worried about that. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you screen for that? And how do you, you, you know, your employment process of, of onboarding, you know, employees? Yeah, well, the the quick answer to that, Bruce, is I don't hire people in any position in my company unless I think they're high character. I'm not interested in their skill set. I know that sounds like, what do you mean? I'm genuinely not. I want to know if you're a good human being who gets what I call, I call it the heart of a servant. I'm looking for someone that gets internal gratification out of serving others. Mm -hmm. And those typically are high character, high trustworthy individuals. Now, Mm -hmm. of course, in business, when you're dealing with cash and employees, I mean, you have to understand that it's also just part of the equation that, a, a, you know, there's some risk involved there too. Sometimes you're going to trust the wrong person and you're going to lose some money and you got to let them go. And you just write that off. It just is what it is. Um, but yeah, the other thing I'll tell you about the laundromat industry is it's actually rapidly changing because our industry is 20 to 25 years behind the times. We just are. Mm. I believe it's actually a great thing about the business because it screams opportunity. But we're, we're one of the last industries in the country, if not the world, to, uh, to embrace technology. It's like literally been happening over the last five to seven years. And so what's happening is a lot of these cash businesses are no longer cash because they're evolving from cash basis, mean either you put coins in the machines or you take cash dollar bills, paper bills, put them in a, a value transfer machine, which spits out a loyalty card. And the loyalty card is what you use to start the machine. That's been our industry forever and ever, amen. That's our payment systems. But now what's happening is phone pay and credit card transactions and debit card transactions and scanning QR codes and things like that. And as those things happen, what happens is a customer comes in and let's say hypothetically walks up to a machine, which this is in my store. They swipe their credit or debit card or tap it right on the machine. And that money goes right into my bank account and they hit start and that machine runs. So our industry is actually evolving and it's a very slow process. I'm definitely at the, at the cutting edge of that for sure. Uh, but there's, there's probably 10 to 20% of our industry that have embraced that. Um, and it, it really changes the game as far as the, the cash handling that's required. Now, some people like this business because it's a cash business because they can skim off the top and they don't have to pay taxes and you know, they're, not, they're not honest and, and that's whatever, that's their choice. Let's not pretend that doesn't exist. Um, but I'm much more interested in the big picture. I have no problem paying my fair share of taxes. So if you're, if you're in that environment, in fact, I sleep really well at night, knowing that I do everything on the up and up, despite what a hundred people may do. Um, I sleep really well knowing I can't get caught doing something I didn't do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you, when you take all those things into account and they all factor into like this, this sort formula or this soup, right. Then what ends up happening is it just makes a lot of sense. And what ends up happening is your industry evolves because of technology. You embrace things like credit card and phone transactions. And what happens is now you, you evolve from an antiquated business that's very cumbersome and mom and pop, and there's a risk and all these things. You evolve to this other side of the industry. I call it the top of the industry, which is scalable. And any small business that isn't scalable can still be a great business, but it's usually means you're self-employed. Rachel, you mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. It usually means you're self-employed. You're not a business Mm -hmm. owner and there's a difference. But when you build a scalable business model that you embrace technology and the things that come with it, sky's the limit, guys. Sky's the limit. 
This is so fascinating. So let's, um, I like to pull a lot of the threads together here. So one thing I want to come back to, uh, just real briefly, I think sometimes we can have this idea that if there's competition, that's going to be bad for me. And essentially you didn't look at the competition. You said the nine other laundromats that were in your 20 mile or however your radius, you ended up also building some of those laundromats. So can you talk really quickly about the idea that how was it good for your industry to improve multiple locations, not just one? It wasn't, you, you weren't looking at it competitively. You weren't saying, well, I'm gonna compete against this other laundromat in the area. You said, I'm gonna raise the level of operation of the whole laundromat industry in this whole area by investing in multiple locations. Can you just talk about that for a second? Cause I think that's really unique. Yeah, the, I mean, I think it really just goes back to kind of intentions and heart, which is, you know, I'm, I'm my heart just on my sleeve. It's just kind of who I am. Um, whenever, whenever I've approached anything in life, I've always said, I want to do it to the best of my ability. And I don't really care what everybody else is doing. Like, it doesn't matter to me. When I came into this industry, I just looked around and I was like, you know, these are good people. I'm not here to insult them. They're good people, but the bar is really low. And they seem to have what I call comfortable complacency. They seem to be okay with that. Well, that's not who I am. In my, in my marriage, my being a dad, uh, in business, it, pretty, every, pretty much every aspect of life, I get up every day and have one goal, and it's to be better today than I was yesterday. That's mm -hmm. it. That's awesome. I'm not competing with you and Bruce. I'm not competing with my competitors in the area. I'm just trying to get better every day. I'm trying to serve people better. I'm trying to increase my knowledge base. I'm trying to be more emotionally intelligent <laughs> than I was mm -hmm. yesterday. All these things are factors, right? And so when you do that, what ends up happening with all those competitors is typically one of two things. Either they sit up and they pay attention and they say, well, I'm going to, like, I'm not going to let this guy just take me out and I'm not going to let him dominate the market. So I'm going to step up my game. And I always said, I want to meet that guy because I want to have lunch with him because mm -hmm. I'll help him. That's awesome. Because servitude to my community matters that much. Mm -hmm. But the, we also know that there's a good portion of people that are just going to call you names or stick nickels in your quarter slots and jam up your machines or sabotage or leave you negative reviews online that aren't even like they aren't even fair. Um, mm -hmm. they're just trying to sabotage your business. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that can, that can put some chinks in the armor, but, but they're focused on hurting me, which means they're not growing their business and they're not focused on serving their community. And every day they do that, they're going backwards and I'm going forwards. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was really never any more than that. Like, I don't, I never needed to make it complicated. I was just like, I'm not a keep up with the Joneses kind of guy. I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm happy to show the Joneses how I did this if they genuinely want to know, because there was a time when I was, you know, younger than I am now, a little bit more immature than I am now. There was a time where after I figured out this industry and I looked across the country and I was like, oh my goodness, like 80% of the laundromats in the country are in a terrible state of disrepair. What an opportunity. Like I want to own every laundromat in the world. I want to have 800 laundromats someday because that's just my personality. And my wife was like, you're freaking crazy. But what ended up happening is I networked. I networked like crazy. I went to conferences and events, read books, online forums, Facebook groups, anywhere you could find somebody that owned a laundromat. I wanted to know them and get to know them. And what ended up happening is I learned that the laundromat industry is full of a lot of really good people who want to run their businesses better. But our industry, because it's so mom and pop and antiquated, there's not much networking happen. There's not much mm -hmm. sharing of information and there's not what you had on a minute ago, a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. It's, it's almost the opposite of that in a lot of ways. And I decided, you know what? I don't need to own every laundromat in the country to make a difference in the world. I can own four or five, 10 in Cincinnati and build a team that can operate and run those laundromats, which they do. I don't work in my businesses at all anymore. I don't do anything in my businesses. Um, and so now what I spend a lot of my time doing is I wrote a book and I launched a podcast and I've taken it on as my next level of servitude to the world or my industry to teach other laundromat owners how to do this. Mm, and the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people in the industry that aren't okay with that. They don't, they don't like that I'm doing that. They don't like that I'm bringing people together. I'm uniting people. I'm sharing information. My book behind me there on the rack, it's called Laundromat Millionaire, which is where the moniker came from. 
And it's my life story of how I went from rags to riches, cliche, and how I, all the things we've talked about. And I wrote that book, understanding that I'm not going to be a best-selling author. I'm probably not going to sell more than a few thousand of those books, if that. Um, and so I'm probably going to lose money on that deal, but it's a scalable way to share information. And I love books because books are how I've learned almost everything that I've talked about in this interview today. And so if I could create an asset for my industry based on my knowledge and experience, and I could give back in that way and create other evergreen products like podcasts and things like that, then we can start to share information and we can start to network with each other and build relationships. And the people that don't want that, they're not going to take it no matter mm -hmm. what. But, the, oh, but there's, a, there's a lot of good people in our industry that want to do better. And, uh, and it's, there's, there's a, there's a mini revolution happening in our industry right now. And it is that my book is titled laundromat millionaire. You probably can't read it, but the tagline below it is the grit to elevate an industry. That's my mission. That's who I am at this point at 45 years old is I want to still own laundromats. I always will, but I want to teach the world two things. One, how great this industry is because there's a big misconception out there that it's not a real business. It's just, we own a couple bubble gum machines in the middle of a white box and it's not a real business, which is ridiculous. And I want to find people that own and operate laundromats, but want to do it better that I call them the 10 year old Dave men's the ones that are hungry. They're mm -hmm. not complacent. They're not comfortable. They just don't know how they don't have the information. And I'm just bringing, I'm trying to bring together this group of people in our industry um, that are, that are really moving the needle. And I really believe that I'm not the only one doing this, by the way, mm -hmm. this is not like a one man show. There's a group of us that are, that are kind of just deciding this is what we're doing. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is a laundromat is a vital community resource. That's part of the reason I got into this business. I didn't want to own the 90th pizza shop, uh, you know, on, on, on Beachmont Avenue. I wanted to own a business that the community needs, like vitally needs. And I wanted to go into an industry that was underserved. I talked about it earlier, people being in pain. And that's why mm -hmm. I was attracted to this industry. It's why I've done what I've done with my own retail stores. And as I've gained that knowledge and experience, now I just want to share it with the world so they can go do the same in their communities, whether it's in Houston, like Bruce mentioned. I literally just a couple months ago came back from Houston, an equipment distributor out there invited me to come speak at their event. And I spoke to about 60 laundromat owners. They flew me out there and and I, we, we spent the day together and, and hopefully I left my mark on that community. Um, and that's, that's something I'm really, really passionate about now. It's really exciting that you keep mentioning serving others. You mentioned being high character, this idea of servitude to others. We've had Rabbi Daniel Lappin on the show. I don't know, four times now or something along those lines. Um, we've also had Bob Berg, who's written or co-authored the, um, the go giver, the go giver. Yep. So Lappin has written um, multiple books, Thou Shall Prosper being one of the, the top books that I highly recommend. And both have this idea and this vein that dollars follow value. And truly it's a principle. It's a principle of wealth creation as you find a way to provide true value for others that money, monetary income is a result of that. It's not saying I want money. I want to be a millionaire. I want to you know, be wealthy. That's not the thing that drives your result of having that, those dollars flow into your life. So I just, I wanted to highlight that because it's a key principle of wealth creation that you exercise and acted on in the beginning saying, how can I serve? How can I meet a need? How can I improve the community and make other people better? Um, then I also just really wanted to point out this whole idea that um, you said, you said so many things, but, but one was that now you're, you're changing your family line. And so your kids now are seeing a different opportunity in their life as a result of what you are choosing to pave the way and choose to create. And I call that being a first generation wealth creator. You put on this mindset of saying, how can I truly do what's best to improve my family, to not only have financial capital come into my family's life, but to improve our quality of life? How can I invest in my children money being a component of what you need to be able to do that really well. And now their ceiling is lifted. Their floor is lifted because your ceiling is going to become their floor. And right. that whole idea that you're, you're creating an opportunity for them that they wouldn't have otherwise had 
is also truly profound. Can you just talk briefly about what, what this means for your kids? Talk about what your family, how your family trajectory has changed as a result of Mm -hmm. your choice to grow. Yeah, well, I mean, as someone that takes being a husband and a dad pretty seriously, uh, this all kind of started with me saying, I don't want my family to ever know what I knew. Mm -hmm. Because growing up poor, I mean, that just means you're poor. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in like a really rough area. Like we were really mistreated. It was not a good environment to be in. Um, You know, you you see a a lot of the evil in the world, maybe a little more of the evil in the world when you grew up in that environment. Um, And one, I don't want to ever be in that environment again, uh, but I also don't ever want my kids and my wife um, to, to experience that. So that was the initial motivation was to make sure that we have financial security. And um, the beauty of that is like, you don't have to choose between money and character because as you just really well, just, you know, very good, very well described, they, they follow each other. And so the beauty of business ownership and entrepreneurship when done correctly is that if you focused on serving others and meeting needs in the community, and that's important to you, and you get a lot of satisfaction out of that, what ends up happening is even if the money doesn't follow, which it almost always does, but even if it doesn't, that's okay. Because every hour of my life is valuable. It's important to me. Every minute of my life, I don't want to spend it just chasing a dollar. Mm -hmm. I want to do things that are going to move the world. And then to bring it full circle to the kids, the only thing more powerful than what I know today and what I'm able to accomplish with those things at 45 years old is teaching it to kids that are 10. Because it's taken me half at this point, basically my whole life. I don't know how long I'll live. We'll see. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But, but it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of grinding. There's a lot of I don't want to say time waste, but time suck in there, like Mm -hmm. doing it the hard way. And when you can accelerate that process with tools, which money is a tool, and you can also accelerate it by teaching younger generations how to do these things. I mean, imagine what my kids are capable of. Now, I don't know if they'll do it. I hope they do. I hope they move the world in a way that I never could have dreamed of. Um, And we're raising them to do that within their own her passions and desires and, and, and the things that they want to be fulfilled, you know, that make them fulfilled in life. So they don't have to own laundromats, but they still get all the lessons. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of all of this is really simple. I didn't tell you in the very beginning, but I grew up in the antithesis of that environment. So the, my household was, you know, my family, which was a very large family. We were all poor. Um, they, they're good people. They loved me. Like they want, wanted what was best for me. But my entire life, I've been told that everything I've told you for the last hour is a bunch of crap. Mm. My entire life, I've told that. In fact, a lot of them still believe it to this day, even though I've proved to them. Yeah. Even though I've proved to them that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so no matter what my kids do with this information, they've grown up in an environment where they know that the world is available to them. And they know that their purpose on earth here is to serve others. So my 11 year old, my little one, he's like a science nerd. I mean, I, I don't even understand most of what he's talking about and he's only 11. And so he'll probably end up working at NASA or something like completely crazy like that. And I want him to go chase that dream, but I want him to make a difference in people's lives and all the lessons we're talking about, mm-hmm. they're interchangeable from industry to industry, from business to business, yes, they but they're are. also in, they're interchangeable outside of the business world. They're interchangeable outside of entrepreneurship, Mm -hmm. because even if you are a stereotypical nine to five corporate America type of person, and some people are not everybody, we're, we're weird, right? We're a strange breed, us entrepreneurs and business owners, those lessons can still make them a better version of themselves. And so it's not really about laundromats. It's not about business so much as it's about like people, it's about Mm -hmm. life and I'm, I'm kind of an optimist by nature. I mean, I'm a realist, but I'm also kind of an optimist and I just happen to be bold enough to believe that I can do something about it. Despite everyone in my life telling me that I'm arrogant, basically, (laughs) who do you think you are? (laughs) Basically what I was told from the day I was born. (laughs) Well, I'm glad that you pushed through that. And I think it can be 
I mean, you see people be resilient through challenge and struggle and you see that it breaks some people. And yep. I'm just really thankful for the stories of people who've come through that hardship and who've had only the negative uh, worldview around them who still rose above that. And I think it, it can make people who are stuck in that old way of thinking, it can make them feel uncomfortable. And yet at the same time, when you make the decision that is right for you, you truly lift the lid for so many others all around you. And so, um, gosh, I feel like we could talk about this all day. Let's go ahead and pivot to, to the close here. And what I wanna just point out is you kept mentioning opportunity and knowledge. We talk about when you have capital, that is liquidity, you have use and control of that money, which means you have saved and you have put that cash in a place that you can access and touch and put into opportunities. So you've built an opportunity fund plus knowledge. So liquidity, use and control is L-U-C. K is knowledge. Luck is what happens when you put that opportunity fund to work with the knowledge. So you built this knowledge, you built the opportunity fund, you married them together. This is a lesson for everybody to say, find out what you can do to build capital today, then build your knowledge, stay in your lane and focus on those investments that truly are in your zone of genius. So if somebody is either A, wanting to now get into the laundromat industry because of this conversation, uh, B, they already own a laundromat and they want to do much better, or C, they're just in a situation where they are an entrepreneur already or they want to get into business. They're in a position of, of saying, your lessons are valuable for me in the space that I'm at right now. Dave, tell our listeners, how can they get in touch with you? How can they get your book? And what do you have available for them to take the next step in their life? Yeah, well, those are things I'm all actively working on right now. My book is finished. Um, that's a that's an author copy behind me there. I was fortunate enough to, I, I thought for sure I would be self-publishing and the book got to the right people and I ended up getting a publishing deal with uh, Morgan James Publishers awesome. out of New York. And so the book will be as of this, I'm not sure when this will come out, but in June of 2022, um, yeah, June of 2022, it'll be available pretty much everywhere you can find books. Do you have audio an actual books, date? Books. Um, I don't have a date. Okay. I don't have a date. I know it'll be sometime in June because it's all up to the publisher. That awesome. being said, if people want the book and they're watching this live or whatever, they can go to my website right now and get the book. And I, um, it's a pre-sale. I'm fulfilling on myself and what I'm doing is autographing every copy. So they can just go to my website, which is laundromatmillionaire.com. Um, it's laundromatmillionaire.com. Um, and let's and also can, spell millionaire because for some reason I'm an excellent speller. And this is one word that I do not spell accurately. It's M I L L I O N one N A I R E. Right. Make sure you spell millionaire accurately. Yep. <laughs> That's right. So the book is the beginning of that, but we have a podcast called the laundromat millionaire show. And a lot of our audience is, is definitely laundromat owners, but the, the, the podcast is put together in a way that it's really for anyone. Um, We've talked about this for an hour, right? All the lessons and attributes and things like that. Um, and so they can check that out. Um, I have other resources available. Actually, I'm launching in the next couple of weeks, my first e-course, which is designed for people that want to get into the laundromat industry. Um, I've spent about a year putting that together. So it was not, it, it's, it's, the value is through the roof. I mean, a hundred X of what you're going to pay for this course is what it's worth. Um, and so those are, those are some things that we have available to us right now. Um, we actually are having our first laundromat millionaire conference, which is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, it's March 2nd through the 4th, um, of 2022. So it's in like, you know, a month basically, and we plan on doing those every year. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create assets and environments where people can come together and learn from each other and network. And the reason is real simple. That's how I learned. Mm -hmm. And so the best way to teach somebody how to do what you did is teach them how you did it. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what we're trying to do with Laundromat Millionaires. We're creating different assets. We're going to create more courses and things like that. And we, we're not sure where it'll go, uh, but it's just taken off like a rocket ship. And we, you know, it's, it's just, it's exciting to have the opportunities, but yeah, you asked where they can reach me. They can reach me through my website, laundromatmillionaire.com. I'm very active on LinkedIn under Dave Laundromat Millionaire. And I'm very active on Facebook under Dave at Laundromat Millionaire as well. So those are probably the three best places to reach me. 
Awesome. Well, Dave, this has been really an insightful conversation. I think um, anyone who's listening knows that when we have somebody on the show, it's going to be a good conversation and it is always going to be a little bit more, a lot more than just what it looks like at the face value. <laughs> so we talked about so much more than the laundromat business today. Yeah. And so thank you so much just for sharing your heart and for sharing your story and really, truly deciding to serve others. Bruce, before we wrap up here, is there anything that you wanted to share in closing? Uh, just in closing, I think uh, if the main point, which you know, I think is a main theme that comes across with a lot of people we have on the show, is that there's no secret formula to success, but there are some really good principles and guidelines. And the one that they brought up is the one that is the one that seems to be the one that is a constant theme: is the serving of of to people and what they need. So if you can find what people need and serve them without worrying about the money side of it, the money will follow the value that you create. And, and Dave's just showing us that's, that's a true again, just like many of our, our guests. So thank you for being on Dave and sharing uh, your wisdom with everybody that's listening. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks Dave for being here today. So in closing everyone, please remember success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love.